So um, even though if you maybe already have an EDIS, I still think it's worthwhile to step back and say, what type of problem are we trying to solve? And it's very interesting is that what people say the problem is versus what we've done. All right, what we're trying to solve is the expense of transcription. Right? Now, who says that? Well, hospital administration, your EDIR docs don't say that because they're not paying for those transcriptions. But now they want you to either pay for the transcription or you know, use this EDIS, which is, again, you're still paying for it, you're just paying for it with time. So what I always said, well, as soon as the surgeons start paying for their transcriptions for their op notes, and they start doing those with the computer, then, then we'll do that too. Why are we any different than any other physician? Um, and again, there are ways to, uh, to, to mitigate that. Okay? So for example, I might say, well, I want to put an EDIS because I need to track patients. How many people still using a grease board? Almost, okay, well actually a lot more than I would have thought. So we want to track patients. Why do we want to track patients? Are we losing them? Are they following into a black hole? I mean, is that a problem? Well, it does happen. Um, but really what we want to do is to be able to capture metrics. Because if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. All right, so how many people believe that the current tracking systems, the electronic tracking systems, actually capture accurate enough in information to improve and to base changes upon? Okay, you are exactly incorrect. All right, um, there is no way that in a manual tracking system that you can get accurate information, and I will tell you why. We had one, but I tell you what, I learned how to make my numbers look good. All right. I worked at 9 p.m. I worked Friday, Saturday, Sunday night shift for almost my entire career. I would come in at 9 p.m. I worked 9 to 7. All right, when I would come in, the last guy had been slowing down for the last two hours, so there were like nine patients to see. So I went to the computer, I signed in, and I signed up for all nine patients. So I saw every patient at 9 p.m. When did I really see those patients? All right, now the nurses learned this too. They didn't discharge a patient until they were ready to discharge them. So it made my times increase. So I used to sort of like discharge the patient for them and tell them, I've already discharged the patient. You know, so they knew now my, my time is done. So people will game the system with a manual system. So, so if the issue is we want metrics, we want to be able to track patients, then why would we use a manual system versus an automated system? All we have done is to automate a poor manual process. We've taken the grease board and we've electronified it. We haven't improved it. Only we've added additional overhead. So if I had to tell you, if you were gonna spend your money, rather than spend a lot of money on an EDIS or rolling out CPOE or something, I would say install an automated tracking system. It's huge bang for the buck. It relieves overhead and will give you information that you cannot get in other ways, okay? Um, so, give, uh, Winston Churchill, give us the tools and we'll finish the job. What are the tools? We, you know, the basic components of an EDIS, I'm not going to go over this, I don't have time to do this, but just understand that an EDIS is a really big thing. It's often called a tracking board, but it's much more than a tracking board. And, you know, all these different types of things, and you have to understand what will work and what won't work. Um, and there's these sort of optional things as well. All right, interfaces are still the number one reason for uh, at least best of breed implementation failure, but just because it's a ED module in your health information system, do not assume that it is integrated or interfaced. In fact, a few years ago, and I won't mention the, the vendor, but they, uh, the, there were people at the EDAS meeting because they had to upgrade and spend several million dollars to get their ED module to interface with the, 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 the HIS system because they were on different versions. Okay, so that can still be an issue with those as well. Okay, so you're gonna have to register people. Interestingly enough, there are different ways to do that. Many hospitals still have an ADT system that they register people on, then that information has to go into your best of breed. If you have a HIS integrated system, that may be the same, but it may not be. All right, so you have to be able to build that interface. That's sort of basic um, uh, security. How many people use um, more than three passwords? Okay, how many people use more than 10? All right, so when I f left practice, I had six clinical systems I had to access, eight passwords, each of them changed every 90 days. All right, um, there are ways to mitigate that with biometrics, fingerprints, and so forth, all right, or just badges, sort of this, this um, 
ability to walk up to a computer, it knows you by your badge, who you are, all right? Big, and then the single sign-on. So, so there's, it, it, interestingly enough, easy things to implement. There are some, there are some um, uh, standards that help with that. Um, there are different ways to do it. Um, and this passive proximity, so imagine if you have a badge that's a radio frequency ID, and the system knows where you are and knows where the computer are and automatically logs you on to the computer that you're closest to. Those technologies are available today, not well implemented. And I just say, you know, FedEx can tell you worldwide where something this big is and how long it's been there and where it's been throughout the whole system, but I can't tell you that for my own patients, even if I have a tracking board. All right, so I have a whole lecture I do on that. I'm not gonna really belabor that. Oftentimes, as I remember I said, you know, our tracking system, or really this emergency department information system, although the tracking board is often used as your interface to the system. And I'll show you uh, an example of that in just a minute. Information management is the second most potential for improving efficiency. All right. A few years ago, a study was done at Washington Hospital Center showing that 60% of time by emergency physicians was used just searching for and waiting for information. So being enabling people that to happen automatically and put it all in one place is a huge um, benefit. And that could be labs, documents, old x-rays, old EKGs, all those things that you need to be efficient rather than waiting for that to come from radiology or waiting for that to come from, from x-ray or having it so disjointed. I, the system that, that, that I used for a while, you know, had this tree structure that was just impossible to find documents. And interestingly enough, the date on the header was the date that it was dictated, not the date of the visit. So I actually took a patient when early in the, took them down. I says, you know, you weren't here on that day. Turns out they were, but the date on the system, on the header was different. All right, so this is an example. This is actually a system that I designed. It's not commercially available. Um, and uh, was when I was the chief medical officer for MediServe. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to actually make it work, um, so it went away. But this is a typical type of, of interface. You've got multiple different cues. Now, you can get overloaded with that as well, so sometimes simple is better. But this is a typical sort of, this is sort of an outlook for those of you who use that as your email. Um, you know, metaphor, um, but it's sort of rows and columns, again, like a sort of a spreadsheet. That's typically what people use. But then there's other layers where this different information can be aggregated together. So I have sort of one place to look at all of my labs or one place to look at all of my vital signs and present it in a graphical way that you said, this is the idea of automating that process, sorting the wheat from the chaff, giving me the information and giving me alarms and alerts so that I will know. And integrated, you know, how many people do not have your radiology integrated with your EDIS? Do not have it. So that was one of the issues that we had. So they implemented our EDIS and all they did was the ADT feed. So I got the patient's name and I got their age. Everything else, no labs, no radiology, nothing else. So I got all the pain and none of the gain. So you can imagine that, was, that implementation didn't go very well. So again, having radiology in the same system rather than having to go log into a PAC system. So our PAC system was great too. This is one of the systems. I actually had to shut down the computer, log back in with my login in order to open up packs. Okay, it was probably two, three minutes every time I had to, to, to do that. I, I talked about paper before. Um, you know, again, I'm just gonna make one more thing for automated tracking. This is all the stuff that you need to track. Um, and even, even paper documents and finding with it. Think about drugs. So think about a drug that has an RFID on it. A nurse goes, takes it out of the Pixis machine, takes it, and the system now knows that that was ordered for this patient, that drug, and she walks into the wrong room. Does that ever happen? Anybody ever give medication to the wrong patient? Sure. Would be interesting if a system could warn you, hey, you're going into the wrong room. Anybody ever do that? Yeah, I, I told a family one time that their loved one was dead, right? Because I was shuffled and there's the family going in there. And I was a resident, you know, I says, I'm sorry to tell you that I got to. And they said, well, we just brought him in for a leg infection. And I says, oh, you're not the Wilson family? No. They said, they were very good about it. They said, well, we feel a lot better about the leg infection now. <laughs> now that he's not dead, but um, anyway. So now I always, you know, would go in and say, are you the Wilson family? 
All right, so anyway, so JACO is going to nail us on this, all right? So they've already got these criteria that you're going to have to meet, and so I think that uh, it is probably positioning automated tracking is, is going to have to be done, and we talked about how to do that with drugs. Now, if you're a manager, imagine this. So this is from, um, there's, there's two examples I'd like to talk about. One is Christiana Care in, in Newark, Delaware, and the other is uh, Albert Einstein in Philadelphia, and this is from Albert Einstein, a um, friend of mine there did this. Now, look at this. This is productivity on individual physicians and sort of have these parameters. What's going on with this guy? Way out of there, right? So what's the typical thing that you get? Well, you only looked at 10 patients. You picked the worst. No, we looked at every patient that you saw over an entire year. Just eliminates all that monkey business, right? And you can follow this actually almost in real time because it's all automated. In fact, you can set up algorithms so that you can, it turns out there was a study that was just done, if you look at certain parameters, you can predict reliably about four hours in the future what staff you're going to need based upon what's coming in the front door. Wouldn't it be great to be able to know four hours I need to call somebody in rather than waiting until I'm completely overcrowded and then try to find somebody to come in? All right, so those, those technologies are available. So I like to put it this way, you know, mobile computing, you know, if you want to sit down and do your work, that's okay. If you have to sit down, I really believe the technology has failed. We need to be mobile. We need to be able to do our work where we are, at the bedside, in the bathroom, walking down the hall, not sit down to a computer. Microsoft has done this research. Every time you sit down at a computer, you will sit there for about 10 extra minutes rather than getting up and doing the next thing. So there's some of these technologies. I'm not promoting any of these. I don't have any investments in them, but you know, motion computing is one. It's getting pretty close to really almost an ideal solution. There are some others from some other companies. So if you're not using these mobile technologies, again, more than one way, you need PCs, you know, desktop PCs, you need mobile PCs, you need, bit, you need multiple different ways to interact with this, these systems to make it um, reliable. The airlines have figured this out, right? This goes back to what you were talking about. I know when I walk up to the airline counter, you know, when it leaves, where it's going, and if it's delayed. In fact, I can find it on my PDA now, right? Even driving to the airport, I know if I need to, you know, park in the expensive parking or if I can park in the cheap parking because I'm a little bit late, All right? We have that. So, you know, this example again from Arkansas Children where this heads up display, you know, HIPAA compliant and everything, you give them a code, they know where they are in the queue. So it's that constant feedback that just really are, are not only good satisfiers, but, but it helps people understand the, the, the process. Um, Self-registration. How many people believe that you can do this? Not everybody can do this, right? But again, they understand, they're engaged, they're helping you, and they're also feeling like they're doing something. Plus, it's keeping them occupied, giving them something to do. It's all about something to do. So they implemented this at Arkansas Children's as well. How do you triage a thousand people suspected of the avian flu? Is that ever going to happen? Probably already has, all right? Well, this is how you do it. It's a job only a computer can do. So it turns out, just like the airport, right? You have multiple terminals, right? Doesn't require human interaction. You ask these seven questions and you can reliably tell whether somebody is at risk for avian flu or not. You add one additional question and with 100% certainty, you can know whether they have the avian flu and of course that is an irresistible urge to crap on windshields, all right? But if they answer the questions in a cer certain way, they go this way and if they don't, they go that way. It's that ability to triage and to, and to sort people automatically, all right? How do I know you can do that? Because you can do it at Arby's. You can order online. You can even order, I mean, I have Starbucks now. You can order in advance and it's sitting there waiting for you. You don't have to be in the queue anymore, right? You can order it from the car. They're doing this at uh, Parkland as well and some other places. We've, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about CPOE. I think it's good and bad. Um, the one thing that I will mention about CPOE is that it's really only efficient if you use order sets. If you have to do the death by a thousand clicks, it's probably not going to be beneficial. So that's good and bad, right? It's good because you will order things that you might have forgotten to order. I mean, how many people have sort of gotten to the end of the abdominal pain, you sort of realize you forgot to order the pregnancy test on the, you know, female, right, happens. Um, but the issue is that it also allows you to order things that you really shouldn't. And so you will typically see a bump in your utilization. Now there's different schools of thought on that. Because the hospital's already bought the equipment, the personnel, and everybody else, 
they actually, in sort of a not so good way, benefit from that because most of those are going to get paid. All right. So again, back to what Sherry was saying before, you sort of have to check your conscience and try to figure out, but, but it's really is a risk on these order sets um, for, for over-ordering a lot of stuff. And that can also slow you down, if, particularly if you're ordering tests that, uh, that are it, um, issues. So this is just an example of doing some um, chest pain protocol. Be really good if you could do that um, medication checking sort of in real time. Well, what does that mean? That means that you have to have that allergy information early in the process. That means that you have to have done the medication reconciliation process early in the process, because otherwise it doesn't do you any good to do medication checking after you've already ordered all the new medications. So what that means is you're, if you're going to do an EDIS, you're going to have to move people to the front of the process to collect this information in a timely way. A lot of people forget that. They forget they have to change their workflow. So you have to capture that information. Uh, actually, patients can help you do that. There are some automated systems that are coming around that will automatically enter that information. So uh, again, another thing you have to think about. All right. Um, so this is an example of, you know, so I'm going to order this medication, penicillin, but they're allergic to penicillin. I didn't either know they were, or didn't ask, or they didn't tell me, but I knew it from a prior visit. Now, that's all fine and good, and that helps me from giving somebody potentially, you know, bad drug for the interaction. But now I have to ask myself, well, what is the right drug? What's the next choice? So does anybody know a pregnant female allergic to um, cephalosporins? All right, what's the drug of treatment antibiotic-wise for pyelonephritis? Hmm? What? Well, macrobid is a static drug. Pyelonephritis is not going to work. Okay, Bactrim, again, static drug, not good for pyelonephritis. Well, they're allergic to cephalosporins. Congratulations. Oh, so, so again, okay, so, so why do I ask this question? Because this came up one time with me, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, what is the drug? Well, wouldn't it be nice if the system not only told me they were allergic, don't give them that drug, but also what is the recommended drug? It's genomycin is the answer. I only know that because I had to go look it up. All right? So again, having these automated decision, decision support tools are really what we need to get. So automating that process. All right? Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about disposition planning because I believe that we really screw up on the workflow. We should start discharging people as soon as they arrive. All right? Why is it that somebody comes in with a laceration, all right, and I wait to the very end after they've already been uh, sewn up and the dressing is put on, I'm going to go in and now do the discharge instructions. All I've done is added another five to ten minutes to their ED stay. Rather than educating them about, okay, we're going to sew this up, that's what this is all about, but also when you go home, this is what you need to do. It's not like I don't know that, right? So again, take advantage of the time that people are waiting and do that in an automated way, all right? Um, turns out 78% of patients did not fully understand the care or discharge instructions they were given. 80% of the time patients weren't aware that they didn't realize they didn't know. So not only do they not know, they don't know that they don't know. Right? That's pretty bad. Now, what system could, so what we're doing now is not working. That's the point. All right? So even sending a doctor, a nurse, in to sit down with somebody and tell them at that particular moment it's not working. You talked about the pamphlets, right? Where do those pamphlets end up? On the floor, in the trash. They're not looked at. I'm going to give you an, uh, uh, an alternative that I think has been proven to be effective. So first of all, we need to have engaging discharge instructions, not the 10-point font that's you know, like over half the page, right? So it needs to be like a magazine. It needs to be engaging with pictures and all that sort of stuff, all right? And then I think that then you can do that with color printers. Again, the airlines have figured this out, all right? Edutainment. Educate people. Now, this, this actually is true. This is the sign that was on this, adult videotapes. It was sitting in the, uh, the hallway there. This is pediatric up here, but anyway. Um, so this is an example of where I think that we have not leveraged that technology. So how long does it take? Do, do, do you guys get consent for an LP? Yeah? It's usually about half and half. Some people say, no, I tell them flip over and stick a needle in your back, you know. 
Other people say, well, no, this is what we're going to do. This is why we're going to do it. And they do this informed consent and they have them sign them. My hospital required us to do that. How long does that take to do an informed consent for a, a lumbar spinal tap? Two minutes, okay? How long does it take to do it right? I know the answer to this. Pretty close. It takes eight minutes. You know why I know? Because I made a video that's eight minutes long that does it, right? Well, so now I don't have to go in the room. I can just play a video and they can watch as many times. And oh, by the way, at the end, it asks them questions. Did you understand this? If they didn't, they can look at it again, right? Let me show you an example of what I'm talking about. Maybe this will play. I don't know. I guess it's not going to play. All right. Well, anyway, so the, the point is that it's actually, this one's in Spanish. So it only takes twice as long to do it if it's in Spanish and you don't speak Spanish. So think about multiple languages and the efficiencies for, so we did one for crutch walking, for, for lacerations, for spinal, all these things that you do, it's the same information. And oh, by the way, when you get to court, you can say, here's what we showed the patient with 100% certainty. All right. So again, leveraging some of these technologies we don't commonly use. What the number one advantage of EDAS is, is task management, being able to prioritize and keep track of what we want to do. If you're not doing task management with EDS, then you really are missing the biggest opportunity to do that. And again, particularly with alarms and alerts, remind you to do things. Now, what used to happen to me all the time is I would go see a patient, they were bad asthmatic, I would listen to them, man, you sound terrible, we'll get you a breathing treatment. All right? So I order the breathing treatment, I go see a couple more patients, I come back around, I listen to them and says, man, you really, feel, you really sound bad, I'll get you another treatment. What do they, just, what do they say? <laughs> I haven't had the first one yet, right? Kind of embarrassing, it's been like a half an hour and nobody got around to it. Why, why, didn't, why didn't they get the first treatment? Well, in one hospital, the EDIS sent the respiratory orders to the respiratory department where there was nobody at the computer or it's printing it out, that was an issue. So it wasn't connected. Um, the other thing is they call respiratory. Respiratory calls back. The person who called them is gone. And respiratory says, it's respiratory. Anybody need respiratory? Anybody need respiratory? Um, I guess not. We'll call you back. All right. Why not have an automated system where it goes to a PDA? It says room 10 ED respiratory treatment stat. I got documented that it was done and the person doesn't have to even call. All right. So closing that loop. Other alarms and alerts. Turns out that, for example, patients who are discharged from the hospital, about 80% of the time, there are labs pending that the patient and the primary care physician is never made aware of. Right? That should never happen. We should have an automated process that does that. And there are lots of other examples. All right? So I, I, this is the Spanish translator example where we used to call them and they would, you know, wouldn't show up because nobody knew you needed one. Um, then there's all the staffy reports and all that kind of stuff that people think they're going to do. I would add your list of things if they're going to make you use an EDIS, particularly HIS, to say at the bottom here, okay, we're going to take the commitment to enter all this information. Here's the reports that I want somebody to look at every month and then follow up on that. Because the dirty little secret is people are spending an enormous amount of time and effort putting stuff in that nobody ever looks at. All right? I'm going to talk a little bit about physician documentation. How many people are using computerized physician documentation? Really, not very many. Okay. Um, dictation, uh, dictation. Okay. Um, paper templates. Um, voice speech recognition. Okay. What did I miss? Okay, scribes we'll talk about in a minute. Okay. So it um, turns out that this is the most difficult thing to do with an EDIS. So I'm actually happy that you guys haven't done that. If I were to advise you, I'd say don't do it. All right? Don't turn your physicians into tra tra transcriptionists because it's really just not efficient. All right? um, so um, this is from uh, Rick Bucata. It's kind of a long thing, but the bottom line is that, hey, we produce a lot of stuff and, and, and uh, having physicians be the ones doing that it doesn't make sense. This was his estimate um, that how much money it costs for every minute spent charting, 20 bucks could be generated seeing patients. I, I think that's a little over the top. Uh, I think more real world estimates based on some research is more like about $4.40 a minute. All right. So if, so think about this, if it takes you one minute longer to use a computer to complete your documentation, that's $4.40. Now, if you have more time than you do patients, it doesn't matter what sort of system you use. That's not very common. 
$4.40. What does it cost for um, dictation? All right, so about seven bucks a chart. All right, you're gonna have to pay something to do this computer documentation, about 250 per charge is what it's gonna cost you on average. And so $4.50. The bottom line is, if it takes you one minute longer or more to do your computerized documentation, you've lost all the value of getting rid of what you're doing now. And if it's if you're using paper now, it's even bigger. That's the point. The best I could do was 11 minutes, all right? Um, so it was more than double, okay? So, um, so what are we looking for here? All right, we want some innovative solutions, all right? So I, I do wanna make this point. So waiting for the ultimate solution is no solution. You guys are already down that road. Um, saving money, uh, you're probably not gonna, well, let me, let me rephrase that. You're not going to save money. You are not going to save money using it. It's going to decrease your productivity. You're going to have to put extra staff. There may be other reasons you want to do it. I'm not saying it's beneficial, but if your objective is to save money, you're going to be very disappointed. Don't do all the bells and whistles and don't do it all at once. All right? So what is important? Consider transition, you know, three to five year solutions. Understand that you may have to replace the system. They're gonna go out of business, it's not gonna suit your needs, they're not gonna keep up. There's gonna be some reason about every three to five years you're going to have to change or upgrade the current system, all right? Um, we talk about performance and all that. Um, this is um, based upon not formal research, but what we've heard in the industry. That initially when you go live with the system, you lose about 20% of productivity, then you know, the EDIS vendors will tell you you will gain about 10% permanent gain and that will be your steady state. All right, that's what they do when they, when they sell you the ROI on this, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So you're, you're capturing a hell of a lot more money. Okay. All right. So there's several assumptions in that. All right. First, right. So there's several assumptions in that. One is you're assuming you're not losing that productivity and losing all those gains based on the decreased productivity. All right. And so I was an IBEX user. Okay. You're also assuming that smart physicians can't be trained to document well by a variety of different other systems, whether that be paper templates or dictation. Our downcode rate at, in, in my emergency department, after a, just a little bit of education, was 0.25% with 100% dictation transcription. Okay? So there's a lot of assumptions in what you said, and that's what these guys will tell you, is that you're gonna have way better work. Okay, our experience with our billing is that de our billing decreased by 20% because people couldn't go through all those codified fields and get it, unless you were willing to commit, commit fraud and say all other systems reviewed and normal, all right? And you can do that. So I will ask anybody here to name 14 systems, because that's what you'll be asked on the witness stand. Of course, you'll be prepared for that now. Right? But right now, I bet nobody in this room, well, very few people in this could name 14 systems out of the box, all right? So again, it depends, and yeah, maybe it does work if you're really, really crappy now with your documentation system. The T system, paper templates, actually are probably one of the, one of the better with regard to, because it's really just a billing document. So this is reality. The reality is you're gonna lose about 30, 20 to 30% of your productivity initially, and that you're probably gonna have about a 10% sustained loss of productivity with EDIS. And it's more than just the transactional part of this, it's also now you have more stuff to look at that you feel like you have to look at. All right, that's the reality. And so how do you mitigate that, all right? You hire a scribe, all right? So uh, Rick, we call them scribes, that's a misnomer. All right, yes, they do some scribing, but they really are a handmaiden. They're the person who tees you up to make you efficient. So, um, and there's some pretty good case studies on this, one from um, uh, Texas Resource uh, Systems in, in, uh, in Houston, um, where they did an epic implementation with the ED, and they had already had scribes in place, and they, they had no loss of productivity. 
All right, and I actually went and observed that. And it was interesting because I went in with one of the physicians and just watched the scribe who was sitting over the corner. Her patient's not even looking at him. And the physician listens to her heart and says, well, your heart sounds good, regular rate and rhythm. All right, stomach's a little tender over here on the left upper quadrant. We'll have to, need to take a look at that. He's like talking to the patient while he's telling the scribe what to put in. And so there's double whammy there, right? You get good patient satisfaction. They think you're paying attention. The scribe's writing it all down. And the scribe, he says, well, you know, I think what I'm going to do is my standard abdominal um, workup for this. And so then that's what the scribe puts in. There are some physicians that actually use two scribes, right? Um, so um, are you going to be as efficient? I, I think that you should do scribes whether you're going to use an EDIS or not, all right? So, um, you know, again, ask the right questions. You'll get the right solutions. Um, do it the right way. I recommend that you do it in a stepwise fashion. You may want to do one or two, three phases at once, but don't try to do it all at once. The Big Bang um, often is very, very painful, all right? Um, again, it's all written up, and these are the sort of the assessment. I'm going to go through just some pearls, and how much time do I have here? Am I done? Oh, I get to go until Rick shows up. All right, we could be here all afternoon. All right, so number one pearl, all right, fix the other crap in your emergency department before you layer on technology. All right, it's just kind of like, you know, having a dysfunctional marriage, and I think we'll have a kid to make that better. All right, it doesn't work, all right? What do I mean by that, okay? Well, this is my department, and uh, we brought in about 100 new pieces of equipment, including a bunch of printers, and I was sitting there one day, and somebody smelled smoke, and one of the printers had caught on fire. And I thought to myself, I wonder why that was. So I went to another printer and I looked in the back. No one had maintained that printer for months and it had collected enough dust to actually catch on fire. All right? So I complained to my CEO and he started laughing. I said, what are you laughing about? He says, well, my printer's been broken for three weeks. I can't get it fixed either. All right? So if you don't have processes in place and if your system for your discharge is dependent upon specific discharge printers and that printer goes down, guess what? Don't put these knee knockers in there. I don't know who thought that we needed to have these keyboard things, right? So I just brought my, you know, electric drill and took those out. All right, don't develop a person that, positions that, that automate poor manual process. We've sort of already talked about that, but here's an example. I love to go to hotels and, and look. So where are you gonna, where's, what's the button for the, for the floor here? Right there, right? No. That's the button. How stupid is that? <laughs> right, and I did that. I pushed on that little black thing because it looked like that was the button. But yet we do that with computer systems all the time, right? In the user interface, we make things that, well, that's what I should push, okay? Uh, if you want to read up on that, it's called affordance, all right? And it's the idea if you walk up to a door and it has a handle, what does that tell you? I should pull, all right? Like this door, what, what does this tell you should do? Push. If I had a handle, I should pull. Well, it's really frustrating to have a handle on, then you pull and nothing happens. We do that with IT, all, uh, with user interfaces all the time. So the less human input, the better, uh, and, but don't automate poor manual processes. Spend as much time and money selecting hardware as planning the deployment. This really drives the IT people crazy. You mean I'm gonna pay a million dollars for this license and I'm gonna have to spend another million dollars to make it work? That's another dirty little secret in IT. There are, there are companies in the health information system world that have not sold a new license in five years. And they're making a fortune off of the consulting work around making the software that they sold people work. All right? So realize that you're going to have to do that because if you don't, and you know, I didn't make this stuff up, you know, there's the evidence. All right? Space design. John Huddy, a uh, friend of mine that's healthcare architect said, there's never been an ED design with enough space, there never will be. Um, and so this is uh, the, our implementation. The first day I came in, and this was the computer terminal that they installed uh, for us to use our new system. That was day one. The second day it was there. The next day it was there. And the next day it was there. What's the problem here? The problem is that we've just sent the high school kid to plug the computer in. We didn't think about the space design and where we're going to put those extra 100 pieces of equipment and to make sure that that space was functional. And so this little um, system here 
you know, you've got this, and then right over here is another one. You can only get two people in there. And now all of a sudden, the house, uh, house residents come down and they sit in, in my seat and they log me off the computer, right? So again, you have to think about other things other than the technology. So what, one thing we did was we moved the, the nurses out of the nurses station by doing these, yes, have these cows? I'm not talking about the nurses, don't, don't go there. All right. In fact, some people call wows now, workstations on wheels. Why? Because if you leave one of these in a room and you say, go get the cow out of room three and they happen to be barometrically challenged, you're probably going to have a complaint. All right. So, you know, yeah, it's got this huge box CPU. It's got a, a battery that could start a car and it's plugged into the wall. It never moved. Three years, it never moved. And the fire department loved it because it was right by the fire extinguisher, right? All right, so this is very telling, all right? So, you know, very frustrated in, in using this system. And quite frankly, this is 1985. We haven't come very far. But, you know, it does give you some place to eat lunch. All right. Um, or step stools. This is from a friend of mine. They put in this system and it printed a lot of paper and they brought in this huge printer. They actually had to, to put a step stool there to get the stuff. All right. So standards, you know, when it comes to hardware are important. You know, if you have the right size screen, you're better off. And, and really the size screen now is a minimum of a 21 to 22 inch screen or even larger. Um, you know, don't use these uh, sort of non-standard keyboards where the delete keys in the wrong place or these non-standard mice. This is actually a ball wheel thing and thing plugged up and didn't work. All right, um, you know, plan for where you're going to put these printers. Um, you know, think about that. Um, so decide what you need and what you want. What you get should be somewhere in the middle. Okay, buy for today, not tomorrow. So this lady's uh, sitting here and they says, you know, I really hate when we go on Dow time. We have to do everything manually. All right, playing solitaire. Um, so this is shift change, high acuity ED. This is a real picture. Here's the EDIS. Here's the grease board. Three years, three years after implementation. That's the implementation problem. Um, downtime, how many people su still sustain downtime? Yeah, okay. I don't know why. You know, I got a computer that's been running for 10 years, never turned it off, right? But somehow hospital systems, my system had to turn off everything for four hours every week to do payroll. I don't know why that is, but during those four hours, we didn't have access to the main hospital system. Very frustrating. Um, I don't know why that is. Shouldn't have to be. Um, paper. How many people put in an EDIS but are still using substantial amounts of paper? Yeah. We actually had to buy a paper system to manage all the paper. You saw the hole puncher before? We were producing so much paper now. Again, part of that had to do because we weren't interfaced properly. All right and we had to have a backup system. All right, so more people believe in Santa Claus and believe there'll ever be such a thing as a paperless office. That's a real poll that was done. Um, and even the best people say it's gonna be 2024 before we reach that in the broader scheme of things, outpatient. Um, the cost savings of documentation is in building a better system to capture stuff automatically. I made that point. I talked about passwords earlier, so this was my experience with it. You know, you gotta minimize the bloat. Single sign-on is great. You know, so I said, you know, one day, I'm really tired of this, so I'm gonna create a password that I won't forget and that really won't make IT very happy. All right, so I create a new password, all right? And of course, immediately, I got a, an error message, right? So, um, <laughs> realized being cute doesn't always work. So, um, <laughs> this is Bill Gates early on, says you have to be careful about confidence you know, you're going to make mistakes. So understand you are going to make mistakes, plan for making mistakes, but fail early, often, and cheaply. That should be your goal. Plan to make mistakes, plan to fail, and have ways to deal with that. And learn from other people. Other people have been there. You can learn from their mistakes, all right? And so you don't have to suffer that on your own. Um, I like this. This is a sign that they put up just to tell people, hey, you know, we're doing this thing, just sort of that information thing. Things may be just a little bit slower. We're, we're installing a, a new system. Implementation really is make or break. This is what you want. You want your super users reading the newspaper. All right. If your super users are running around doing all the work, then you probably have a real uh, implementation problem. So train without that pain. 
Avoid the kludge, which is a badly assembled collection of uh, parts hastily assembled to serve some particular purpose. Here's an example. So um, I've got this CBC here. Um, and uh, the problem is that I speak English, but it's written in Hebrew. It's going the wrong way. So quite often what we would find is that you would look at the labs, because they had the labs from the oldest first, right? And so we look at that and we would make the wrong decisions because we assume that the most recent ones were first. This is, this is not a particular system, but this is a conglomeration of those that I collected, sort of these little foibles. So you have a six month old that weighs 59 pounds or kilograms. I don't know which it is. Both of them are too much. So we ought to have a system that knows that. They ought to know that the, the age is six months and there ought to be a range. And if they're outside that range, it ought to say, did you miss write this in? And also brings up the question, why am I weighing somebody on a digital scale, then having to write it on a piece of paper and then go put it into a computer? Why isn't the scale connected directly up to the computer so I can't make that mistake? And it could also say, hey, this is out of range. This is real, this is a real case, all right? The temperature was 987.9, real chart, all right? Not all in the same chart, right? Um, there's uh, that additional triage information. I don't know why that's there, and I also don't know why the social security number is right in the chart. I will tell you one of my gaffes is I actually did use a real chart. I did not realize myself that the social security number was on the chart and I showed it at a national meeting. I had to go to HIPAA class over that, right? My, my question is, why is it there? That is so stupid, all right? And here's the patient. Well, they're not allergic to anything. Well, except for that codeine thing, all right? And then they're, they're allergic to this Toradol, 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 and then there's this penicillin ester whatever thing this is down here, right? So somebody just forgot to put the spaces in, all right? This, this is real stuff, all right? So um, shake them down. Um, if you're going to buy a system, you should have, as I said, with your administration, metrics, criteria. You should also do that with your vendor. And most of the time where things fall down is the vendor says, well, that's your fault, and you say it's the vendor's fault, and guess who's in the middle? And that's the patients and the staff. And so it is both sometimes, and sometimes it's one or the other, but be very, very clear about who and what and what those metrics are going to be. Avoid Mikey likes it. So if all you've ever seen is a horse and buggy, a Model T looks pretty good. Right? What you didn't realize is there's a thing called a Ferrari. Right? And so this was sort of the Ednet story. Right? That's all they'd ever seen. They really didn't realize there was something better. So you know what you like. You like what you know. Um, and so again, avoid the holy grail system. Waiting for the ultra solution is no solution. Um, it's too bad all these things aren't this easy to use. So you know, this maybe is today. Uh, we hope this is yesterday. <laughs> you know, and maybe this is tomorrow. Um, so, so we will see. Uh, and maybe this is the future. This is actually a digital contact lens being developed uh, in combination with Microsoft and the University of Washington with integrated circuit uh, for a variety of different purposes. So think about if you have presbyopia and you have to wear bifocals, if you had a contact lens that could change the depth of your focal length automatically, or if you're a diabetic and it can measure the blood sugar in your tears and have a heads up display, here's, you know, these are all the possibilities. They're actually testing this on pigs right now. They have not gone into human trials. So uh, again, taking things to the next level. So again, for every piece of information that the patient enters or is automatically captured, that's one step closer to achieving efficient solutions. I don't think we'll be good until we get there. We don't have to have the Vulcan mind meld. All right, so that's it. I'll uh, ask, uh, let you guys ask any questions and uh, maybe somebody can find Ricky.